share your words with us now. I just ask that your spirit is upon him as he shares. And may your spirit be upon us as we hear and as we, as we respond to your words to us. We pray for you to challenge us. We cha- pray for you to change us. And God, give us courage to act where we need to as well. We pray for this in your name. I trust that you haven't had to face a calamity in your life. But if a calamity happens or a trauma happens or a tragedy happens, how have you found yourself responding? And what conclusions have you drawn about the character of God when a calamity or a tragedy happens? And where have you drawn your conclusions from? From culture or from people? or from the Word of God. Today we're going to come and look at a man who is indeed a faith hero, another man who put daring faith into action, and he was one who could tell us in the midst of our difficulties that God is good, and God is faithful, and God is sovereign. And he can help us and encourage us when we go through any times of trial, trouble, and tribulation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you help us today to understand what it is to live a life of faith? Lord, so often we find ourselves in difficult circumstances and we don't quite know what we should think and who we should gain our thinking from. But Lord, today I ask that as we look into your word that this might be a message that applies to our life today in a real way. May this be something that helps us take away some encouragement, some hope that our lives, as difficult, as tough, sometimes as terrific as they are in trouble and calamity, can nevertheless hold firm and high your character and your goodness and your grace. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that there was a man named Job, who lived in the name of, in the land of Uz. And that man was blameless and upright. Now let me say, if you have your Bibles today, um, open them to Job, and we're going to have a look at Job, because this man Job can tell us some great things about how to live a life of faith. This man Job was upright and blameless, and one who feared God and turned away from evil. So here we see that this man Job was a God-fearing man. He was a man who would follow God and never succumb to evil. And so this man was a good man. He was a good family man, but he was a God-fearing man. And there was born to him, verse 2, seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. Now that means Job was a wealthy man. Job was a man of influence. Not only was he a good man, a good family man, a God-fearing man, he was a wealthy man. He was a man of incredible stature in his day. His sons used to go and hold feasts in other houses and and he used to even protect the family by praying for them that they might not err while they had these feasts and ate and drank. He, He was a good man. He looked after his family. Now, the interesting thing is that when we go through times of trouble, we sometimes think it might be about what we've done or about the natural order of things, or it could be about the um, circumstances that exist in our society, our culture, and it can be those things. Sometimes what we face is to do with our wrong, sometimes it's to do with natural processes, sometimes it's to do with culture and decisions of government. But here we see there's something else going on. And in verse 6 we read a, a very interesting situation. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord. So here's a council in heaven. And the heavenly beings are gathering before the Lord God. And Satan also came among them. And so the audacity of it, we could say, 
But on the other hand, it's interesting, God is dealing with Satan and in the economy of the universe, Satan has his place. Actually, he was sent down to the earth and he was called the prince of the earth. And so Satan was going back and forth across the earth at this time. And so he had counsel with God and God had some degree of uh, insight into him, of course, and oversight of his activity. And so Satan comes along and the Lord says, where have you come from, Satan? And Satan answered, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. So here we have an interesting understanding about Satan's position. Satan is the prince of the earth. Now, the interesting thing is when Jesus came, he came, of course, to redeem the earth back, to win it back from Satan's dominion and control. That's why Adam was put there, that he might not sin. And then people who were not sinners, not under Satan's control, would redeem the earth back. What happened? We failed. We fell. We sinned. So along comes Jesus, and what is he called? The second Adam. And in the second Adam, there was no sin. So everybody who is in the second Adam is redeeming the world back from the control of Satan. And he does not have authority over those who are the children of God. Anyway, we find that in this situation, um, Satan is going back and forth across the earth. And the Lord said to Satan, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. That God is saying, as you're going back and forth across this world, Satan, have you come across Job? And it sounds like in this council of the Godhead, Satan was sort of indicating to God that uh, he's got control of this world. There aren't any people there following God. I'm the prince of this world. And he was bringing accusation against people and to God about who honours God. And God said, have you considered Job? Have you seen him? He's an upright man. He was without any offence And what he does is fear God. And then Satan answered the Lord, does Job really fear you, God? Has he feared you? He hasn't even had any test upon him. Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all he has on every side? In other words, you've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. So Satan's bringing an accusation against God. He is saying, God, why is he so upright? Why is he full of such integrity? How is it that he is blessing you, God? Because nothing's happened to him that could cause him to not bless you. He's prosperous. He has integrity, yes, but you've put a fence around him. You've protected him. That's why. And God, if you don't do that, you watch. He'll curse you and turn his face against you. And so the Lord said to Satan, very well, all that he has is in your power. Only don't stretch your hand against him. So the Lord, the Lord went on with his counsel and Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now here's a situation where there's something else going on in the heavenlies. There's something else going on that's about the character of God, about the fellowship of his people, about God's contention against Satan, about God's certainty of those who are following him. And sometimes it is in life that there might be a small level of activity like this that's about something you don't even know. It's about something that God is doing for his glory and his greatness and his goodness. And we're caught up in it and we don't know. And so what's our response going to be when calamity comes or when trials hit us? How are we going to respond? And I think Job helps us understand quite a bit about this. So here's the background. That's the situation. So Satan is now back on earth, going back and forth across the earth. And now we hear some pretty horrible news. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the elder brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. So all his livelihood, his oxen, his sheep and all that were were killed off and all the servants who were attending that, so his livelihood is now impacted. 
Now, while he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And while he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have left to tell you. Now, basically his whole livelihood was now gone and that would be shocking enough but then we hear this and while he was still speaking another came and said your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house and suddenly a great wind came across the desert struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead I alone have escaped to tell you and so here now is this horrific situation he was prosperous he was blessed he had the most influence in the east at that time and suddenly upon his life came calamity in the physical world in terms of his livestock and his economic world in terms of his prosperity and in his family world as his three children were suddenly killed how would you respond if that happened That's a tough one, isn't it? We need to be very honest in our spirit. How would we respond? Verse 20 says, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head. He went into grief. He fell on the ground and worshipped. He fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, naked came I from my mother's womb and naked shall I return to thee. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, we could hold that up and say, there you go, that's how you should do it when you lose your kids. Worship God. And in a way, that is right in the ultimate sense. But scholars, as they look at this and as they understand the process of grief, see here also a degree of which this is shock. This is numbness. This is almost disbelief. And whilst it is true that this man was full of integrity and honoured God and wanted to not speak against God, it's also a little bit of an unrealistic response given a human condition. And yet he did this with all his heart. He honoured God, he worshipped, he said, look, I brought nothing in this world, I take nothing out. But as we go along in Job, we see that reality begins to hit down the track. And that's why I can say that this was an initial Uh, almost unbelievable response and is true of his heart but then the humanity took over and there was more that he had to respond to but nevertheless he was a man who could see that God is good God is God I'm not and in the midst of most difficult circumstances I am going to say well I brought nothing into this world my livestock's gone my prosperity's gone my family have gone But I'm still going to worship God. And I love verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Now, there's a challenge for us. Whatever happens, whatever you confront, would you be willing to always say, in everything, I might question, I might doubt, I might grieve, I might have anger in my heart, I might have all sorts of reactions, but ultimately, I will not charge God with wrongdoing. Now, how can we come to that point? How do we reach that? Well, the interesting thing about Job is that we see now a a range of different things happen, and I'd encourage you to take the book and read it right through. It's worth reading through. A lot of lessons in this book. But one of the things that happened is that his wife um, became quite angry about what had happened because, again, there was this council in heaven, Again, Satan came into the presence of the Lord and Satan said to the Lord, well, he has had integrity, I've seen that. And the Lord said, did you test him? Did you see he is a man of integrity? And Satan says, yes, but skin on skin, all people have, they will give anything to save their lives. You stretch out your hand, God, you touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you. Don't worry, he will curse you if you do that. And the Lord said to Satan, very well, he's in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job, from sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job 
scraped himself and sat among the ashes. And then his wife said to him, do you still persist with your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you are speaking foolishness. Shall we receive the good from the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so we find now that he's facing physical problems. Not only did he lose his livestock, not only did he lose his family, but now he's had his body inflicted with the most horrific conditions. And this is all the effort of Satan to cause him to fall from saying, I curse God. And he said, I will not do that in the most extreme of circumstances. And his wife said, curse God and die. He said, I will not do that. Again, I would say, I trust we're never going to experience the calamity of Job. But do we have his resolve to say God is good regardless? And I can trust him in all circumstances. And we're going to see why Job could have that trust. Now, this is a classic story of how to help people in grief and how not to. And we find in this passage there are three friends that come along to offer Job some help. Now, they start off very well, I must say. Listen, in verse 11 of chapter 1. Now, when Job's three friends had heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. They met together to console and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they didn't even recognize him. Such was his grief, such was his anguish. And they wept aloud. They tore off their robes and threw dust in the air and in their and upon their heads they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his suffering was very great this is a good response a good response sometimes in the midst of suffering when someone's going through a tough time just your presence is enough you don't have to have the right words you don't have to give an explanation You don't have to try and justify what's happening and why. Sometimes it's enough simply to have someone's presence. I remember Alan Meyer saying once that he was touched by God about something concerning his father and he was in a deep moment of grief and he came down the front of the church and he sat there and he he began to cry, he began to sob. He was really in a moment of suffering and he said someone came up to him and Uh, in a kind way, put their arm around him and said, what's the matter, Alan? Can I help you in any way? And he said, it shut him down. It shut him down straight away. And he said, I never got in touch with those feelings again. You know, sometimes we just need to be silent and say nothing. Someone might go to the cross and and, uh, have a moment of quietness and pray or have tears. You don't need to rush over and and help them. (laughs) Sometimes it's just good to let them be. And in this situation, the friends started off very well. But let me say, um, it didn't last all that long. Because as we look at the, the subsequent times, you can see that they begin to now try and justify what has happened to Job. And there's all sorts of reasons, Job, why this could have happened. And you read from chapter 4 onwards, Job, you have sinned. Or Job, God is correcting you. And Job responds and says, well, I think my complaint is just. I, I actually have lived with integrity before God. I don't know why this is happening to me. And he starts to question why this has happened. Not losing the fact that he lived with integrity, but just wondering why this has happened to him. He talks about his suffering. He, he expresses his grief. Uh, One of the friends says, Job, you you should repent. There's something going on here and and you need to repent immediately. And I wonder if you have some people sometimes say to you when you're going through a tough time, you've done something wrong, you need to repent. God's judgment is coming upon you. It may not be the case at all. Uh, Job continues to say, I loathe my life. Now he's coming into a little bit more reality. And in chapter 10, he's saying, I loathe my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. And it goes on and talks about the anguish of his heart that he's now experiencing. He said at the start, naked came I almost accepting, but now the grief process is kicking in. He's starting to come to terms with how he's really feeling. Uh, Another one speaks out, Job, you are guilty. You need punishment. 
And Job has a despondent prayer in, in verse, chapter 13 as he, he prays to God, God, show me my iniquity, show me what I've done wrong. I want to know why this is happening. And then uh, they continue on and Job reaffirms his innocence and so on. It just goes on and this incredible poetry book expressing all the lament and all the wondering and all why, what's happening and all the friends giving him such unhelpful advice. Now then in chapter 19, we read an incredible thing. He says, which I think is why he could come to a perspective of life that we talked about last week and the week before. He says, but I know my Redeemer lives and at the last day, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, then in my flesh, I shall see God. So this is right back before Jesus, before an understanding very much of the, the resurrection theology or anything of that nature. But here we see a belief in the fact of a redeemer to come and the resurrection and the fact that in his flesh he will see God. Was that why he could hold on to God in the most difficult of circumstances? Because he knew that this was not the end of Job. This was not the end of his kids. This was not the end of the journey. He would one day be reunited. Well, the friends go on. Even though he had this confidence, they say, yes, but you've been wicked. That re requires retribution. And they speak of his wickedness. Job complains even more and becomes even more bitter in his spirit. And then one of them says, you need to become righteous before God. And he says, God's unsearchable. I can't even fathom him, much less know how to be righteous before him. And so on and so on. It goes right through those chapters. Job even said something that the valiant man look at in verse 31. I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon a virgin. So here is a man who did not even lust after women. And yet his friends were rebuking him and saying that he had sinned and needed to be judged. Well, ultimately, we come to chapter 38. And in this chapter, we find that God finally answers. God finally comes and in verse 1 of 38, the Lord answered Job out of the storm. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. So when we're in this whirlwind, when we're in this storm, when we're in this calamity, God will answer us out of it. And God said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. And God is saying, Job, he doesn't even speak to the other counselors and say, oh, your advice was wrong. He comes to Job and says, Job, you are speaking words without counsel. You're speaking words without knowledge. And what God does now is why Job comes to be settled. God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know, Job. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy, who did that, Job? So what God is doing, he's bringing to Job an immediate clarity about God's sovereignty. And he helps Job by saying, Job, understand who is who here. Understand that I'm God. And as you understand me, you're going to have a greater confidence, a greater capacity to handle your life, no matter what. And I would encourage you to read chapter 38 through to 40. Amazing statements of God. Who shut the sea with doors? Who caused it to burst out of its wombs? And he d deals with all of the issues of light, darkness, day, um, thunderstorms, rain, and says, how did that happen, Job? Did you do it? No, Job, I did it. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that the flood of waters may cover you? No. Can you send the lightning? Do you know how to hunt prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of a young lion? Do you know how the mountains and the mountain goats give their birth? Have you observed the calving of a deer? Can you number the months they fulfill? Do you know the time when they will give birth? 
I do, Job, you don't. So more and more, Job is getting perspective. I'm not God, God's God. And the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. So he's saying, Job, understand that I'm the Almighty and if you're going to contend against me, you're going to find yourself accountable and you must respond. And here was Job's response in chapter 40, verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? Now, here's an incredible thing. I must decrease, he must increase. I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but we will proceed no further. In other words, Job is gobsmacked by the magnificence of God, by his knowledge, by his understanding, by his sovereignty. And that was sufficient for Job to say, I'll put my hand over my mouth. And God goes on to challenge Job just to lay it on the line a bit more. And the Lord says, gird up your loins like a man. I'll question you and you declare to me, will you even put me in the wrong ever? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. And so God is now going, I'm not just sovereign, I'm glorious, I'm majestic. Look on those who are proud. Can you bring them low? Can you get, make them accountable for their wrong? And he goes on to talk about, again, a range of things. And it's incredible Beautiful poetry and description of how God is. Now, we come to chapter 42, where the Lord answered and Job answered the Lord. And here's Job's response, the ultimate response. Having seen God, having heard of him, having been put right on the right posture, he's God, I'm not. Job says, I know that you can do all things, I understand that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I repent in dust and ashes. Things too wonderful which I did not know. And I want to encourage you today that sometimes what's going on in our lives are things more wonderful than we ever know, even though it does not look like it at the moment. And it's so hard to say that when we're going through a difficult time in life. But as we learn to hear God, it became enough that Job saw God and heard of him and understood that he was sovereign. And he would have come to understand that this was something of the heavenly order of things, this was something about the justice of God, this was something about the glory of God, this was something about the place of Satan, about God's demonstration of a faithful person, and Job knew nothing of that until he understood more of God. Now, God comes and humiliates Job's friends for all their rotten advice. But he even was gracious to them and he said, you've got to go and bring offerings and Job will pray for you. I'm not going to deal with you harshly. Now here's a wonderful conclusion. In verse 10 of chapter 42, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends because he had to be humble and gracious. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with his, him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all that had been brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jeremiah, and he goes on to name them each. 
And in the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and the father gave them an inheritance along with the brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of his days. So out of the tragedy, out of the trauma, out of the trial, Job had restored back to him manifold more than he had lost. Now, this isn't a practice and a pattern that I'm saying will be each of our experiences. This is something of God doing an incredible thing with a person in time for his purposes. But if we take a snapshot of that, there are circumstances in our life that are happening sometimes for what we don't understand. And we need to have daring faith. We need to trust God and say, God, allow me to be your person. Allow me to not bring accusation against you. Certainly let me express my feelings and my grief and my heartbreak. But God, I'm not going to turn and accuse you or sin against you because you are God. You are sovereign. And you have vanquished Satan. He has no place in my life. And also, God, you're not necessarily punishing me for wrong that I've done. He was a righteous man. I'm going to stay true to you in all circumstances. And as we do that, we learn the lesson of the sovereignty of God over all things. We learn what it is to trust God. We learn what it is to believe in him. And we learn what it is to not listen to prevailing culture, even friends that we may feel are are good friends, Sometimes their advice can be not as good as it needs to be. Come to the word of God, trust God, trust his character, and I pray that you may, from this experience even, develop a greater daring faith for today. Heavenly Father, help us, we pray. There are times when we don't know what's going on. There are times when we, in our human limited mind, can never possibly fathom the enormity of your character, the incredibleness of your glory, the magnitude of your sovereignty, the greatness of your power. Lord, we just can't even begin to understand. So may it be that we get a glimpse of you and just say, that's enough, my mouth is silent, I'll just trust you. And Father, I'll trust you even though the going seems tough and I'm going to hold on to the truth that this is not the end of my story. Whatever happens to me now is not my end because I know my Redeemer lives and I know that I shall stand on this earth and in my flesh I shall see God. I believe in the resurrection and I believe in the full restoration of all things under Christ Jesus who is Lord of all. And I'm going to hold on to that place and that's going to get through me the toughest times of life. And allow me to stand buoyant even when things look grim. Help us come to that place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's just stand and respond in worship this morning.